Right, then we go, can go press got it. Got it. So I'm just so proud to be able to introduce Krista. I was really looking forward to having Krista with us in person, but of course she is with us in person. Um, but it's just different. It's the wonders and perils of Zoom, but it's so good to have you with us, Krista. Um, Dr. Krista McCurland, as I mentioned before, is um, the theology lecturer at Kerry. Absolutely amazing. I'm always so inspired by um, Christian, Christa's lectures, which sometimes actually kind of morph into a little bit of sermon, like sermon lecture kind of thing going, because she's so passionate about her subject. Um, so yeah, over to you, Krista. Um, Krista is going to allow us to ask some questions at the end if we like, and we will have breakout rooms too. So so if you have questions, think about them and, and store them up. So anyway, welcome, Krista. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, tēnā tātou katoa, onare ki te atua, ko rōria ki te atua. Ko moke moke te maunga, ko Martin te roto. Te nati ko te mana, me nati hamane o ke iwi. Uh, ko uh, Atlanta, Georgia, te papakainga. Ko uh, onere hunga, uh, ahau. Ko Matthew, toku hoa rangatira, ko rea rawa ko John, Aku Tamariki, ha Krista Aho, no reira, tena koto, tena koto, tena tato katoa. Uh, well, hello everyone. Um, thank you so much for letting me be with you this morning. It is truly a treat. And as as Nicholas said, I had been looking forward to this in person for ages, <laughs> and then clearly, you know, the world was going to take a different turn. But it is a joy to be with you today um, online. And then I hope when things do settle down to actually get to meet all of y'all in person. You may have also noticed with my accent uh, and with my mother-in-law here from North Georgia, um, I'm not from around these parts, uh, but it is truly, it's been wonderful being here these last 20 months, even though it's been a bit tumultuous <laughs> these last 20 months, uh, but we feel like we're finally kind of getting our roots uh, planted a little bit more and are, are really enjoying our time um, at Cary and getting to know our Onihunga community as well. Um, so I'd love to just dive in with y'all. I, as Nicola said, yeah, I, I get pretty passionate um, when I talk. That's when I lecture, let alone when I preach. And honestly, the content of today, it's probably the thing that I get most excited about, which is talking about our priesthood. Um, and basically that verse, uh, Luann, thank you for reading that. Uh, we'll, we'll be taking a look at just a couple of verses that lead up to that. And that will be our launch point for our time together. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Um, and I'll come in and out of this a little bit so that you're not always looking uh, at, you know, my PowerPoint slides. But this will help just give you a little point of reference um, as we go. So today we're looking at the church as the priesthood of God. Who are we? <laughs> why do we exist? And that question of why do we exist really is grounded in who we are. And that why do we exist, I'm going to propose to you today, is that we are meant to live for the world. It's what we see Jesus Christ doing as we are basically priests because of his priesthood. Our priesthood is basically couched within his priesthood. We are priests because he's a priest. And so then what does that mean for us and how we, won? conceive of ourselves, but then also in how we conceive of our purpose in the world. And so that's kind of globally what we'll be talking about um, this morning. So to go back over that scripture that's already been read, this a few verses leading up to that. And this is in the, the book of First Peter. <clears throat> As you come to him, the living stone, talking about Jesus, rejected by humans, but chosen by God, and precious to him. That's Jesus's identity. He, is, he has been rejected, but he is precious to God and chosen by him. We too are like living stones. We are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Again, that's that derivative idea. It comes through Jesus. We prayed Michael's beautiful prayer, or Mike, you go by Mike, uh, Mike's beautiful prayer to begin our time. We are praying that in the name of Jesus. We pray that with him. We'll come back to that because that's so important for all of our identity as the people of God. And then quoting this, this text from scripture, Peter goes on and says, see, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone. 
That's Jesus again. And the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now, to you who believe, this stone is precious. But to those who don't believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and a stone that causes people to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. So to those that believe, he is our precious stone. He is our cornerstone. He is the foundation for all of life. But for those that don't understand or don't really haven't maybe even seen the true Lord, maybe they've seen misrepresentations of that Lord. But if those that have encountered Jesus as this crucified Messiah, that doesn't make a lot of sense. This Jesus that calls us to give everything for the sake of others, that's quite a stumbling block for many. And he can make that, that idea can make people fall. <laughs> they stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. There's something about kind of how God's plans have been working out for all time. And God knows some are not going to believe in this Messiah and some are. Some are going to stumble, but some are going to embrace, embrace him as a precious stone. For those that have embraced him as that precious stone, you are a chosen people, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called a royal priesthood out of darkness into his wonderful light. We share in common what everyone shares in common. We were in darkness, and yet we have been brought out of that darkness into his wonderful light. Once we weren't a people, but now you are a people. Now we are a people of God. Once we hadn't received mercy, but now we have received mercy. So this is who we are. But <laughs> it begs the question, do we think of, of ourselves in that way, church? Is, do, do we conceive of our identity in these priestly terms? Or do we think of it in a different way? Have we become something else? Is it, have we kind of maybe become detached from our moorings of being attached to Christ Jesus? So by and large, and I'm pulling some of this from the course that Nicola just mentioned there, we're using this uh, textbook by Tom Greggs. If any of this like really lights you up and you want to know more, um, this is the, the book we've been reading. And that's just a fancy word for talking about the church in theological language, dogmatic ecclesiology. But he has this statement <clears throat> in terms of the Western church. So those uh, that we would be a part of, especially coming from a British line, which ultimately was coming from a Roman line of inheritance. The church has become an institution whose role prim seems primarily at points to be to occupy sitcoms. And the church's worth and usefulness in society is seen by large swaths of the population in terms of its capacity to provide nice buildings and words to mark births, marriages, and deaths. That's all we've become. For so many, that is what the church is. It is just kind of in some ways a stagnant institution, something that maybe rubber stamps certain ceremonies um, and maybe only has significance uh, at marriages and at deaths. And I should be quick to caveat this, however, that's not what's happening in the global south, um, as the church is really exploding in those areas. Uh, and, and the global south will be world leaders within the next 40 to 50 years in terms of population and leading the charge as the people of God, just if we look population wise. But for us, here we are in this very secular context. Uh, this is by and large how society views us. And so when we receive those words, what can often happen is we have this response. In an age of what seems for many traditional Protestant denominations to be a situation of terminal decline, the temptation is to engage in a knee-jerk reaction. Michael Jen Jenkins calls this the hyperactivity of panic. He goes on to say, this manifests itself in clutching for any and every programmatic solution and structural reorganization in the desperate hope that survival is just another project or organizational chart away. But the better response is to calmly ask what it is that God intends in creating a people in the world who are called together to live in the life of the church. So instead of this reaction, of, oh no, we're in a state of decline, what do we do to fix that? Especially in our human machinations, right? Like we try to figure it out. We try to strategize. We try to coordinate. How do we preserve this entity that we have now assumed is the church and part and parcel with God's intentions? Perhaps maybe this is the time to calmly ask what it is that God intends in creating a people in the world who are called together to live in the life of the church. 
I'm going to share unshare my screen for just a second because that opens up this question about well then what is the church who are we and really this is a really big theological question so bear with me I am going to give a diagram to tease this out here in a second but if we want to think prior to there ever being a created order before there was ever a universe a world and you and me God has been existing within God's self for all eternity before there was time before there was history, God as Father, Son, and Spirit have been relating to one another in goodness, in love, in abundance. I mean, God is love, right? And how can you have love if there's not more than one? We need another. And so arguably, and, and, and Trinitarian theologians have argued this from like really the 11th and 12th century, <laughs> that we have to have actually more than one person to have this loving relationship. If you don't have a giver and a receiver, there can't be a love dynamic. But if God is love in God's essence, we actually actually need two. But then someone could say, well, then why don't we just have a binity instead of a trinity? Why do we have to have a third? Well, as I say in class very often, um, some of us have friends who we know once they got married, they just turned in on themselves and then you never see them again. <laughs> they just go off as their little couplet and they're living life and they're rocking it and no real, you know, concern for the world around them because it's just them. Um, the, the new animated show, The Willoughby's, actually has a great paradigmatic example of this. If you watch animated shows, I now know every single one of them going on, what, 66 days of lockdown with a two and a half and a five year half year old. But anyways, this idea of just turning in on yourselves, that can happen when it's just two. And what, and this is not to say that everybody needs to go and have children, but there's this idea that when you open yourself up to the life of another, a third, it allows that love not to just be this back and forth that could still turn in on itself, but it now has to open up to consider another. And so Trinitarian theologians have argued, actually, this is why three is that perfect number because we have the love that is shared then between the three. We don't need more than three because then it's excessive. And so it's the simplest and the best number to have this essence of love shared for all eternity. And so we have the Father, Son, and the Spirit loving one another and having no needs. They didn't need to create anything else. They were fully flourishing within the divine life in that sheer abundance of goodness they didn't need anything else and yet decided to create, decided to set this world in motion. However, that worked out, <laughs> I wasn't there, but set that world in motion to then share that divine goodness with the created order, with creatures, with you and me, not because God had to, but because God wanted to. So it was out of the abundance, the overflow of God's goodness that we even have the world that we have. Now, granted, it's got some issues, yeah? I mean, we're in the midst of that right now. There's this raises questions on how did evil happen and how does suffering happen? That is a conversation for another day. <laughs> but the bottom line, often what we get stuck on is asking, why does evil exist? When I think the bigger question is, why does anything exist? It's not necessary. <laughs> we are not necessary. God is the only necessary being that, that is. And the beauty is that necessary being is God's self love. God is love and then shares that with us. Now we get to see that love teased out when we open our scriptures. That's where we get to see that triune God revealing God's self in space time, in history. And we see that most fully in the person of Jesus Christ. And when Jesus steps onto this planet, what we get to see is the perfect priesthood that had been built upon from all of the Hebrew scriptures, right? So this is calling upon your understandings of the, of the Old Testament and Levitical priesthood and the sacrificial system, all those things. We get Jesus as the perfect Jew, the perfect human, and the perfect representative of the human race. And what we see with his life, his death, his resurrection, and his ascension, that's the piece we often don't talk about very much. I ask my students all the time, so have you ever heard a sermon on the ascension? And most people say no. 
And so then I ask further, well, then what would you say is the point of the ascension? And most people have no idea. <laughs> well, if we think about the letter to the Hebrews, sorry, we're going to go off script for just a second here, but just a little background, the letter to the Hebrews, Jesus talks about, or the, the author of the Hebrews is talking about Jesus as this perfect fulfillment of the, the covenant. He actually initiates a new covenant. So up until that time, Israel relied upon the Levitical sacrificial system. Read the book of Leviticus if you don't know what I'm talking about. It's, it's a doozy. You might want to have a little commentary with you um, and some friends for some support. But it's basically teasing out what God initiated so that humankind could continue to be in God's presence despite human sinfulness. And that system that God set up was a sacrificial system. So animals would be sacrificed outside of the, the city, outside of where the population was. They'd be sacrificed outside of the city. And then the blood of that sacrifice would be brought into the temple. And then depending on what sacrifice it was and what it was for, it would either go on one of the outer uh, altars, or if we think about Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, that was the once a year sacrifice that the high priest who had to be from the line of Aaron, who had to be from the tribe of Levi, would take into the Holy of Holies and basically sprinkle that blood on the altar to cover the sins of the people. But that would only last for a year. And there was also a concern that that high priest, because he's human, could also be defiled in himself. So you may have heard this story before. They'd actually take a cord and they'd wrap it around the priest's ankle and put bells on the fringe of his garment. So if he went into that holy of holies and those bells stopped making sound, they would know God had struck that priest down dead for having some type of impurity in his life. So he had to go through all this ritual cleansing before he could go into the holy of holies. And then they had that cord around his ankle so they could pull him out because you couldn't enter into that most holy place where God's presence was directly mediated and go in and get the body. I mean, this is the, the weight of, of glory that we're talking about here, the intensity of God's presence and power and holiness. He is holy. And you'll recall back, we are now a holy priesthood. We get to participate now in the holiness of this high priest, not from the line of Aaron, but from this new line that Jesus is a part of it's this light of Melchizedek but basically it's this other line of priesthood and so Jesus comes onto the scene and basically it's not just his sacrifice on the cross it's his sacrifice of his entire life his birth his life of perfection yes his work on the cross which notice it happens outside the city just like the temple uh, sacrifices they happen outside the city but now that blood isn't then taken to the temple on earth, but that's where the ascension comes in. Jesus takes his own blood into the holy place. And, it, and the author of Hebrews tells us he sheds that blood in the holy of holies. The holy of holies that actually the temple was based upon. The earthly temple was based upon. He now takes that blood as the perfect high priest and the perfect sacrifice. He sprinkles that blood. And then what does he do? He sits down at the right hand of the father. And he's not just sitting there now twiddling his thumbs, wondering, okay, what am I going to do? He is actually actively interceding for us right now. The letter to first John tells us this, that we actually continue to go to him. Hebrews 10, we approach the throne of grace with confidence because we are knit together with the very person of Jesus Christ. And how does that happen? Well, it's by the giving of the Holy Spirit, which actually couldn't happen until Jesus had ascended to the heavenly places, sprinkled his blood so that we are now covered by that blood and now made holy. Holy spirits can't enter into things that aren't holy. <laughs> So God's Holy Spirit then is able to enter into us as believers in that high priest who is also the perfect sacrifice. And so it's on that basis that we are grafted into the family of God and share in Jesus's priesthood. So here's where the diagram comes in, because that was quite a bit of cosmic uh, <laughs> digression. 
Uh, so basically, we've got what I just described, the sheer abundant grace and divine freedom in the upper left-hand corner. Then that's basically what the, the life of the imminent Trinity, that's just another fancy word for God's being in God's self before there was ever creation. But then God chooses to reveal God's self in the world. And so we call that in, in theological terms, the economic Trinity, the God we see revealed in space time, in the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, and in the New Testament. And chiefly, we see that in Jesus. So that's that first arrow, who is our high priest. And as the high priest, he cleanses us with his blood that we might receive that Holy Spirit now with permanence. We aren't a fear, afraid like David was in Psalm 51. Don't take your spirit from me. Now we have this permanence because it's based upon Jesus's once and for all sacrifice. And then it's in light of that that we talk about who we are as a body. So it's a derivative priesthood. It's a priesthood that is based upon and founded in who Jesus is which then allows us this comfort that it doesn't actually depend on us. We get to participate in what God is doing, but we, it, it's, it's all about what Jesus has already done and how do we help people, the world, know that God and know that God both in our word and in our deed. So this is the objective grounding, the, the, the fixed starting point for how we understand who we are as the people of God is that Jesus as the high priest and the spirit is the primary condition of the church. We see that through the giving of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost, the event of the coming of the Holy Spirit, who is present within the variety and plurality of the community in all its diversity. We see that in the different languages spoken at Pentecost and acts upon the community to make it the church. This body, you and I, even if we're not a part of the same local church, we are in the same community because the unity we have, which has already been prayed for because of Christ's intercession that Mike could agree with, we get to, to come together as this diverse body because it's not about us. It's about Jesus and about the spirit. That's the unifying feature. So then the church is an event. It's an event of the Holy Spirit. So on this account of the church, therefore, what's offered is an account of God's dynamic and intense activity within the life of God's people in time and space between, notice the ascension, how critical that is, and the return of Christ. We live in the already but not yet of the work of the spirit because of Christ Jesus. So the church is in an event, not an institution. And therefore the church is most intensively, our very being is priestly. And it's its priestliness that is meaningful and clear at the bounds where the church meets the world. So quickly, just to roll through what that then means is that our derivative priesthood, Christ is the one who lives for others. That's what is embodied in his whole life, death, resurrection, and ascension. Christ is the eternal expression and self-determination of God to be for that which is not God in creation. That's our story. We, don't, we aren't a part of the family of God apart from God initiating that and allowing us to be in that family. The church's existence is an existence ordered towards the world being redeemed. That is the purpose. That's the why of the church. In its priestly life, the church lives towards those others outside the body for whom it mediates and intercedes. We then get to participate in Christ's priestly mission for the sake of the world. So that then means our boundaries, our distinctiveness from the world is not so we get to feel better about ourselves as some type of spiritual elite. But in fact, it's to be leveraged for the world, to be able to fulfill this ministry. The church needs to understand what it is and how and why it exists. And more importantly still, what the world is, is that which in Christ, the beloved and reconciled creation, and as that for which the church exists, as the creation awaits its redemption. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. We are then meant to live out that same life of cruciformity. So then what will that take for us, church? The church must move from a consideration of its own institutional self-perpetuation. Oh, we've got to keep existing. We've got to keep our, our budgets up and our buildings fresh and the pews full so that we can keep existing. Like it's this, why do we exist? Well, we're not really exactly sure, but we know we should keep existing. That's that knee-jerk reaction Michael Jenkins was talking about earlier. So we must move from that consideration of self-perpetuation for its own sake 
to a consideration of what form a sacrificial institutional life within the church must take if it's to be the church. And that's where I want to leave you all with, I know that was a whirlwind, um, but want to leave you for your discussion time in thinking about your community at Eastview, what might it look like to conceive of your corporate priesthood? You all, we all are priests, but you're in your community and I'm over here in Onihunga. We've got different communities and different needs in the localities that we're placed within. So what might it look like to exist for the sake of the world, Eastview Baptist? Can we conceive of this in that way? So you could talk about that. Is that even, does it make sense what I've said? But then also, if we can, if we can conceive of our identity as existing for the sake of the world, what would that look like for you? How might that change how you view yourself and your spiritual community, East View itself? So that's a lot to, to pack into a breakout room, but would love for you to just consider that, starting with the who we are, to then how that affects what we, what we do in your community and in your daily lives. Cool. All right.